Hi everyone, and welcome back to a Gem of a Secret podcast. We're back after a long hiatus. Yeah, we um, we had a lot going on over the last few weeks. <laughs> uh, I started a new job. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's kind of why we couldn't do our regular filming schedule, which was on Wednesdays. Mm-hmm. We were actually. also on the road taking vacations, seeing the Pacific Northwest and surrounding states as well, because we're still soaking in the area since we're mm-hmm. still months into being moved here. But, um, yeah, we, we took a little bit of a break trying to recollect things. This episode, we want to focus on wrapping up Camp Wanakiki, and then we're going to get really into what this podcast is going to transform into over the coming weeks. Yeah, so so Camp Wanakiki is over, and it's been a few weeks now, so we can obviously ruin who, um, who won the show. So the queen of camp is Tora Hyman, and it's not to diminish this, but seriously, me and Diana both were like, oh, she's going to win. Yeah, like, she was so prepared. She's Ginger Minj's drag daughter, and actually, cool thing for Tora, she's going on tour with Ginger Minj like all over the U.S. Mm-hmm. Like, so cool. Actually, I think they might be leaving the U.S. too, but that's yeah. super great for her. And she's headlining the Austin International Drag Festival. Yeah, so am I. I actually got offered to be a headliner too because I made it to top four. Yep, and that was absolutely fantastic. My final impressions for the top four, because you know, we didn't know who was going to win or anything like that. They filmed all of us winning just like Drag Race. It's not mm. a huge secret. Mm-hmm. And so we just sat there, me and Diana, we were at our show replay that we had at the time. Yep. And me and Diana were holding hands, doing a Facebook Live feed. And like, we just didn't know who was going to win. I I really didn't. Like, the fans loved Kitty and Diana the most. That's that's just a true statement. Mm-hmm. Um, I really kicked butt on that last episode. So I was like, maybe I have a chance. And yeah. Tora's outfit was probably my favorite in the final episode. Mm-hmm. And so they did. They're like, in the Queen of Camp is Tora Hyman. And she super deserved it. She was yeah. so prepared. And Camp Wanakiki was such a wonderful experience for me. I do not regret my time there. I super appreciated getting to meet 11 individuals who will be my friends for the rest of my days. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. This is a good time to say this. So me and Don, uh, Donna are going to keep doing this podcast, mm-hmm. but we're going to do it as a podcast and a video cast. Yes. So twice a month, I believe, I think we're going to try to film it. Um, and then we're also going to have audio podcasts on the in-between weeks. So it'll mm-hmm. be one show a week, like it, um, like it was before. Yeah. But we're going to release that audio podcast and stuff like that. And they'll probably the audio podcast will be a little bit longer, you mm-hmm. know, because people can listen to an audio podcast all day long. Yeah. People don't want to watch our mugs for 20 plus minutes. Yeah. They don't. <laughs> as pretty as they may be. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that's great, though. Coming off of that that big wave that you just rode, I'm sure that it was overwhelming at the time, and I'm sure that there were a lot of highs and lows that you experienced with it, um, and anticipating how every episode was going to affect you every week. I'm right. sure that was a lot of stress, too. It was. It helped me learn how to paint my face very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, One thing, too, that I want to say, actually, it's about moving forward, too. So my drag face, like, so I'm not out as a queer person at work, and I'm Mm -hmm. not out as a drag queen at work either. So the faces that I make, uh, that I've been doing drag, if I have to work the next day, are very, um, no glitter, because it's super hard to get glitter off, you know? yeah. Glitter is like the herpes of drag. Like mm-hmm. It's awful. Um, sorry, no. Glitter is the herpes of the craft world. Of the craft world and drag. And I mean, drag, well, too. Well, maybe herpes is the herpes of drag. <laughs> the herpes is the herpes of drag. Some of us queens are hoes. <laughs> True. Just saying. Not a lie. <laughs> so, um, so I haven't been able, since I haven't come out with those things yet, Yeah. Uh, I, I am not going to have such dynamic makeup or whatever mm-hmm. for a little while. Um, you know, something to get off easy after a long gig to be able to make it to work by 8 a.m. Yeah. So. Yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. Cool. Well, we're glad to be back, everybody. And basically what we wanted to do for this podcast was just kind of catch you up on where we're at right now. Yeah. So yeah. I had a question for Donna, because this is more so what the podcast is going to transfer into anyway. Mm-hmm. So like we said before, me and Donna moved here in March. Well, she moved yes. down in March. Moved I in came March. in June. Yeah. And so what was it like... You know, being at the top of your game in a city to starting over in a new city, a bigger city, a bigger Uh scene, lots of drag entertainers across the board, and now you're like a chess piece on this board. You know, um, Portland and the people here are extremely kind to newcomers, and so it was really easy to feel welcome and to feel appreciated appreciated and validated in my drag, um, simply because everyone was so kind and, like, very welcoming and warm. 
you know, I get here and I felt automatically as a new queen that like I was gonna, you know, have the opportunity to make my place here. And that's the cool thing is that you do have that opportunity. There is a lot of drag in Portland, however. So when it comes to finding a way in at the time, what I have been doing and what I was doing was trying to make drag basically a second job. Um, when there's an influx of queens, it kind of, and a lot of queens too that are, are maybe working for tip spots and not really working for a booking fee, it makes it hard to get those gigs. So finding my way through the city and navigating how I would be able to bring the costumes that I bring, you know, that are mostly made for me. Um, either I've designed them or I've had someone help me design them and, and then someone else has constructed them because I'm a very, very impatient person and I don't like being behind a sewing machine. <laughs> um, but uh, feeling that I was going to be able to have money to invest back into that drag and still keep doing that here in this new scene, um, that has still proved to be a little bit challenging. Um those gigs are a little bit rarer, but you just have to find them and you have to find the right people to talk to. And networking is really important as a new queen in a new city. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm speaking specifically from a business sense because there is a business sense behind drag. Yeah. Um, I think when I was younger, I thought a lot of it, drag was partying. A lot of drag was just going out and having fun. But now that I make it part of my livelihood, um, there is a way to be business savvy about drag and this one right here knows what she's doing when it comes to that so I learned from the best yeah so I um, I have a series that I do on my Instagram um, it's called Coco for Thought and so the thing about the business side of it so the one thing I can actually appreciate your sentiments because when I moved here um, I hit the ground running like I had a, jo a show like two days after I moved here mm -hmm. like when I officially moved in June 5th. I think I had a show June 7th. Like, yeah. It was, I hit the ground running. Me too. My mom came yeah. with me. It was great because my mom helped me move here. Yeah. Uh, move here. And the other thing that happened with this is I noticed that they don't necessarily want to pay a lot of entertainers here in Portland. And that's not a dig against the city. It's just there's not a lot of show producers who are willing to pay mm -hmm. entertainers here. Um, there's not a lot of venues uh, for entertainers to work in to get that coin. Mm -hmm. um, most of the most successful drag entertainers I've seen have worked in some straight bars doing like bingos and yeah. karaoke's yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. And the drag show market doesn't necessarily pay. Um, I'm yeah. not talking about tips. This is all about booking fees. Yes, yes, yeah. Because uh, tips are on a scale. Yeah. If it's like a horrible thing's happened in the city, like a Proud Boys rally, the tips are down for the whole weekend. Yeah. Or if you have pride, obviously tips are going to be There's a concert super up. going on that night. There's, yeah. Yeah. It's just like, it's so up and down. So mm -hmm. you can never bank on that, but you can. Yeah. It's the booking fee aspect of this city that I've noticed. Um, it's, it wavers. Yeah, it wavers. for sure. For sure. It does. Um, but yeah, like I said, overall, the, the Portland scene has been very kind and welcoming. It's, it's been crazy. Um, it was crazy doing it on my own when you weren't here. I think that was definitely the hardest part was um, I was, I lived in my home city for 27 years, so I have never lived anywhere else. Um, being on my own as a queen, basically, and trying to navigate this new social scene um, where I'm making new connections, I was like constantly feeling at this like, like insecure space. And um, th I've gotten over that now. But it was, it was really, like, scary being kind of dropped into this, like, completely new pond, a much bigger pond than what I'm used to, and uh, navigating it on my own. How did you deal with, so in any drag scene, there's always a lot of drama. So how did you deal with, like, your first couple weeks, um, somebody coming up to you be like, oh, I don't like this other entertainer mm. for this person that you just met? Because, you know, it's funny, when you get booked out of town, you'll usually hear something about somebody mm -hmm. in the show, somebody else in the show doesn't like. Yeah, no, there was a lot of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I kind of just had to take it with a grain of salt. Um, because the thing is, like, other people's impressions of other people are exactly that. They're just impressions. Yeah. Um, and uh, once you hear it more than once from certain people, then maybe, like, that can influence you. But even then, I always, I always make sure that I have a personal interaction with the person or yeah. whatever before I rush to any kind of judgment because that's that's I don't know that's mm -hmm. it's not really not really fair to base it solely off of what other people are saying you I, know I agree with that I I heard a lot myself when I first got here too yeah um I had this motto for the longest time I still kind of use it but not really I used to say um 
I am I'm in my building I'm in my building months. I used to talk about how um, I don't know any of you. I used to uh-huh. say that all the time. Yeah. Like even after two months, I'm like I don't know any of you. Yeah. Because it's true. It would, I mean, after two months, you don't really. Yeah. You can't have a best friend no. in like two months. That's not how no. that works. And I always and the biggest thing I always to say is I'm waiting my turn. Yeah. I used to say that quite frequently. Yeah. Because the thing is, I knew that I was successful. I knew I had a lot to offer. Camp Wanakiki hadn't aired yet Mm -hmm. um, when I first moved here. And so I was, like, going to bank on that. And that did. It helped me get my start and my bookings and Mm -hmm. stuff like that. And it helped me get that show replay that I did at Stag PDX. My favorite show to perform in that's a regular show is Black Magic, easily. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. That's um, the producer's Rogue Safari for that and co-host is Devlin, Lynn Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And... That is one of my favorite shows. Specifically, it is specifically because of the theme. I like mm-hmm. seeing black at school and some people of color like being able to showcase their abilities. Um, the show hasn't had the best turnout since I've done it, yeah. necessarily, and that's always really hurtful. Um, it's discouraging. It is that's, discouraging. Uh, yeah. But I've always felt the ability to do things at that show that I haven't at other shows, mm-hmm. and it just really like makes me feel a little bit freer yeah. because of that. Yeah. And I don't know. I just kind of got my best life because of it. Like, yeah. That was, yeah, so that was, like, one of my favorite shows. And then kind of everything else falls on the same line for my second favorite shows. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't have any that kind of, like, excels to the top of the list because, like, Mm -hmm. I'm still new here, so I'm still learning all of the shows. Yeah. And, like, what I like to do with them. Then there's shows that are super popular, don't get me wrong. But I think for, like, on the secondary level, the one that I do want to talk about is actually the Superstar Diva show. Oh, yeah. I yeah. like doing that show. I love doing that show. I super love yeah. Bolivia Carmichael's uh, Reba. I love when Honey mm-hmm. comes out and does literally anything. Any um, live sing, just, something like, theatrical. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah, then no. I'm super in love with Isaiah's just having... The boy less, The boy less, Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that aspect to him. Which is so cool. And him then, and Johnny both doing that together is neat. And I think the reason I like it so much is that Honey, because when I first got here, I didn't live sing a lot. Mm-hmm. And Honey was like, well, if you want to do Superstar Stevas and live sing, you are more than welcome to do it. Mm-hmm. So that was one of the few shows outside of Black Magic that I actually sang at when mm-hmm. I first got here because I was super intimidated. Yeah. And so that really worked out in my favor. And so don't get me wrong. There's a lot of other shows that I appreciate. Mm-hmm. But those are the two that I wanted to. Kind cool. Of cool for my local in-town stuff like always i want to plug starlets and harlots which is our um every other week show and actually we don't actually know when the next one of that's going to be because of thanksgiving yeah so um one thing i did want to say about that because i wanted to give this plug like we talked about with business and drag so one thing that i'm doing as a show producer for that because me donatella my secrets and donatella nobody are the producers of that show Mm -hmm. one thing i'm doing is through my llc is i'm actually booking uh, entertainers at a higher level than what the bar is offering to pay us for the gig mm-hmm. and specifically yes that sounds like a stupid business plan but there's ways to make up that money uh, like with VIP seating or just other mm-hmm. things like raffles mm-hmm. and assigned seats even just yeah. reserve seating like there's something ways to that make can money. happen later on once there's growth to that yeah, yeah. so what we're doing is um, so I'm booking the entertainers at a higher level and just to be very transparent because entertainers don't seem to talk about that like a decent booking almost across the entire United States for a non-TV drag entertainer is $50. Mm-hmm. So yeah. all of this head to toe, your booking fee, sure the tips might be good, but your booking fee, a decent booking fee is like 50 bucks. Mm-hmm. And I know that people think that that's a really low number, but that's literally what it is. A great booking is like 75 yeah. honestly. Yeah, yeah. And so for Starlets and Harlots, the base fee is going to be $60 for the entertainers that we book. With potential, yeah. Yeah, so, and then if they bring five people, it'll be $75. If they bring ten people, it'll be $100 mm-hmm. um, for the booking for that show. So yeah. So I'm really excited yeah. to... That's about. really important. That's actually another thing that I wanted to talk about um, in this podcast, this episode, was the culture shift that is kind of happening in Portland right now. Because we talked about at the beginning how... Um, booking fees are kind of something that it's it's harder to get bars on board with paying entertainers with that sometimes um, sometimes all you need to do is ask as an entertainer and just mm-hmm. or you know make that demand for yourself and then you know the bar will will meet that if you if you come to them with a good business sense of what you want to accomplish yeah um, one person that really really started a culture shift for that here in the city was Flawless Shade with the show that she had at Henry's Tavern. Unfortunately, uh, the venue itself ended up having some problems and closed, but uh, Flawless really started something great with that, with 
making sure that entertainers that were, you know, the featured entertainers for that show and co-hosts were paid very nicely. And not just paid nicely, but taken care of at the event as well. And that's something that I definitely am excited to see more of as we as we live here in Portland. Hopefully that's that's something that it's kind of shifting more into that. And yeah. and these girls that are bringing a high caliber drag are getting paid for with the money that they're putting into their craft. You yeah, know? because I mean, I know... I know that drag doesn't necessarily have to cost money, but what I want, like, so I'm starting to commission wigs because I just don't want to style. I just don't. Yeah. And I want to commission wigs, and commissioning wigs costs a lot of money right now. And for any of the wig stylists I use, um, and I'll say their names, I use Flawless Shade, Amy to Kill, mm-hmm. or who I use, and it's not necessarily cheap. And yeah. so being able to, like, have a show that will pay you enough to at least get one wig yeah. is really important. For me, um, it's about adapting some of these skills to my own drag, you know? Like, yeah. I've I've had to be able to learn how to be self-sufficient and style things how I want them because, you know, like, that's one thing that I, I as I've been here, have not really been rolling in the dough, so I haven't really been <laughs> able to, like, reinvest back into my drag. So with what I have, I have to take and transform it, and um, yeah. that's... That's my way that luckily, you know, when I was living in Colorado, I was making enough to to be buying new outfits, to be investing back into my drag. But right now while I'm here, um, it's kind of be about repurposing and kind of being a thrifty queen and, and yeah. making what I have work um, until um, I can't no more. <laughs> so I wanted to do this. Um, I, I have this thing called hashtag feed the positive that I do every mm-hmm. once in a while. So I kind of like us to always like maybe one episode, like every episode we do this. So I want us to say one person that Mm. like in the drag community that we like a shout out for them a positive reason why we either like them or Mm. we're just like obsessed with them or why we live for them Mm. um and it doesn't mean if you're not getting called out in a specific episode it doesn't mean that we hate you or we don't like you Mm -hmm. or you're not good enough it's just this episode we've talked about this person for specific reasons yeah more likely it's always going to be like within the last week this person did something great and i just remembered it yeah so who would you like to do for your first one and it can't be autumn she was on the show already she was (laughs) she was uh oh there is someone that i really just recently at a show was really helping out and i love it when a queen shows up to a show out of drag and is there present helping the entertainers out. Oh. And knows what it's like to be stressed out trying to run down, change into your next costume and get ready, especially if the show's running quickly. Um, Amy To Kill is the person that I would like to mm-hmm. feed the positive to and uh, shout out for this episode. She not only is an amazing wig stylist, she does a lot of Coco's hair and she's done a wig for me as well, but she um, is the type of queen that when there's a show going on, she knows what it's like to be a queen and be in that stressful environment, so she does everything she can to help out, and I absolutely love and adore her for that. So, cool. Amy Tequila, you're awesome. So, going along with that, I'm going to choose Bougie Cherry. Now, <laughs> which, it's funny. They Sorry, weren't Donnie. just at our house last night or anything. No, no. <laughs> and, and the reason I choose Bougie is actually a kind of selfish reason. So, Adam has been kind of getting known in the community. Adam is my fiance. Adam is getting known in the community as being a drag show DJ, which has been really great. Mm-hmm. And so, Bougie has a new branch opening at Culture. Mm-hmm. And she asked Adam to DJ and is paying him. And that's great. I know we talked about a lot of money, but we're all poor. So, it just yeah. keeps coming up. Yeah, anyway, yeah. so that was super great that she actually took that friendship and like applied it and used it for a brunch that she's starting. Mm-hmm. But on top of the fact that Bushi is one of the most booked people in Portland. Oh, yeah. And honestly, she's becoming a really dear friend of mine. Mm-hmm. And I can talk to her about anything. And so you have to remember, we don't know what people do for Christmas or Halloween or certain theme shows because we just got here. Yeah. So I meet, we threw a Halloween show for replay and bougie showed up looking absolutely terrifying yeah and i was like because i've seen her always doing like really beautiful looks Mm -hmm. and you know that fashion diva that barbie Mm -hmm. and she came looking like a monster (laughs) and i was just like wow and then throughout the whole month of october just serving those looks left and right Mm -hmm. and she was kind of the person i didn't envision being that absolutely fantastic at drag Mm -hmm. like looks uh, like sometimes people get typecasted and yeah. she definitely is a person that will go in and fit your theme completely and just serve it. Oh, She'll yeah. also perform like lower than her booking fee for her friends if mm-hmm. you need her for charity or yeah. gigs like that. 
but honestly, she's one of the most book queens. She holds her worth at that level, and I love that. Mm-hmm. And entertainers like, I won't work for less than, you know, blah, blah, blah amount. Mm-hmm. And so I wanted to shout her out because she is absolutely a dear person, great friend, amazing entertainer. I love yeah. watching her. She was the only cast member at Legacy when it was the right. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. Yep. Bougie. Awesome. Well, I think that is it for this episode. So thank you guys for tuning in. We're really excited to keep this going. And I like this more because I feel like the conversation is flowing more natural. We don't, we're not like referring to a template and being like, <laughs> so this is what happened and this is what happened. Like, it's a little more conversational and mm-hmm. it feels a little bit uh, more natural. Yeah. So this is nice. I, um, I enjoy this and I look forward to producing more episodes where we're talking either about different things in the Portland scene or just different hot topics within the drag community. So Yeah, so um, next week it'll be an audio podcast that we will release hopefully on schedule and on time because we're really trying to stick to this. Mm -hmm. We'll have all of our social media in the comments, but I'm at Coco Gem Holiday. And I am Donatella underscore my secrets. Yeah, so we'll see you folks next week. Yes, bye.